Hello everyone. Today's module is climate change and culture. Last time we were talking about food sustainability and I rambled on at you for about two hours and so I made a commitment to myself and to you that this time I would be shorter. Uh, you know, to my own credit, last week's topic was a huge topic, food sustainability, so it makes sense that it took two hours. Um, but climate change, that's of course not a huge topic, right? I should be able to get through this one very quickly. No, obviously this is a gigantic topic and I'll only be able to scratch the surface. And in fact, today, uh, mainly what I want to do is draw out some points from the readings um, for you to think about because I think the readings this week were great um, and I think that you can kind of get a lot from those, but I also think that there are some broader ideas that I want you to get from them. So with no further ado, let's jump into it. When we think about climate change as not just an environmental quote unquote issue, but a cultural and ecological issue, it makes us think about the human costs, drivers, and impacts of climate change. So part of what I want us to think through today is what are the types of impacts of climate change that we typically think of, such as rising sea levels, and what other types of impacts are there. So I deliberately put in some readings that were sort of um, out of left field as far as impacts that we might not normally think about. Um, I want us to think about what makes people vulnerable to climate change. Is climate change something that all 8 billion of us are equally vulnerable to? Spoiler alert, no. <laughs> and why not? And what are different factors? I want us to talk about some of the impacts and I want to talk a little bit about resiliency as a concept connected to culture and climate change. And again, all of this will sort of be scratching the surface. Just a few thoughts. First of all, I'm going to assume that most of us are at a baseline level familiar with the science of climate change. Um, it's a fairly straightforward concept, but the idea that, well, I shouldn't say the idea, um, the reality that increased greenhouse gas emissions, as well as other non-anthropogenic sources, um, as well as other kinds of anthropogenic sources, such as agriculture, um, have increased the level of greenhouse gases. Greenhouse gases, as you can tell by their name, trap in heat radiation from the earth after sunlight has come through and then it's radiating heat back out into the universe. Greenhouse gases trap some of that heat. Now, um, a protective layer of greenhouse gases slash atmosphere is necessary for life on earth. It would be a frozen icicle, popsicle without it, an earthsicle if you will. Uh, but of course we can overly elevate the level of greenhouse gases and therefore cause a higher temperature than we've been used to uh, for most of human history. Since cultures are keyed into specific kinds of climate and climate conditions, uh, that might very well pose a problem for cultures. And indeed, much of the concern is how we adapt to these profound changes at a cultural level, as well as for ecosystems that are used for used to certain kinds of temperatures at certain kinds of latitudes and certain kinds of storms and certain kinds of sea level rises. What happens when these get thrown out of whack, as it were? It's not that anyone's denying that historically there have been climatic changes. Um, certainly this is a very, very accelerated version. Um, and it is worth noting in human history that even relatively minor climatic changes have sometimes been the determining factor of one culture moving into an area while another one um, doesn't do so well, as we have a few examples of that here in Alaska in the archeological record. And so, so yeah, our, our concern is that to some degree, well, we have many concerns with climate change. One of them is that our cultures, our societies are kind of keyed into a status quo that is now being disrupted quite rapidly. And the question is, is it being disrupted so rapidly that it's gonna have really catastrophic effects? So that's a bit of what we're talking about with climate change. Um, and of course, the effects of climate change are larger than just increased temperatures, although certainly as this graph suggests, and pick many other probably better images, but um, overall global temperature, average temperatures have increased in some areas, they've increased quite a bit, such as the Arctic. Um, but it's not just heat, it's a number of other things that are in one way or another tied in with heat, uh, such as melting polar ice caps, sea level rise, which is a factor not just of melting ice caps, but also um, the nature of water and how it can expand under heat conditions and a variety of other things. Um, increased storm intensity, which has been being a prediction that climatologists have been making for decades and seems to be 
definitely happening. Uh, so increased frequency of intense storms or increased level of intense storms. Um, and then also a pattern where drier areas become even drier. So exacerbation of droughts, exacerbation of wildfires, things like that. So a lot of different impacts other than sort of just the most obvious of getting hotter. Now, in Alaska, um, some have, many have said, and this is from Libby Roderick's great book on Alaska Native culture, um, frequently asked questions, but some have said that here in Alaska, we are at ground zero for climate change. Um, and she says, few have acknowledged that Alaska's native peoples in rural communities are at the center of ground zero. So she's arguing that not only is Alaska sort of ground zero for climate change, but there's different vulnerability depending on which communities you're living in and who you are. Now, what does that mean to say that Alaska is ground zero for climate change? Um, like other areas that lie within the Arctic, generally conceived, Alaska slash the Arctic more generally is warming um, quite a bit faster than other parts of the globe. There are a variety of reasons for that. I am not a physicist and I will not make myself appear very foolish by trying to summarize the science of this, um, but that is the record, the trend that we observe. It's um, kind of like twice as fast, maybe not quite that extreme, but close. Now, if you look at sea ice cover from 1984 to 2016, this would be summer sea ice cover, you can see this, or sorry, winter sea ice cover, you can see this really clearly, um, a 50% of loss of sea ice over the last 40 years. That is not insignificant at all. It's significant enough that now there are very serious discussions going on about what's going to essentially be if trends continue an Arctic shipping route all of a sudden open between Europe and the US. Um, so the question is who's going to kind of control that waterway and that's certainly a discussion uh, that different countries are looking at keenly uh, in some cases. So yeah, there's been significant impacts that we've observed. We've also observed other things um, on an anecdotal level. I don't have a great statistic on this, but plenty of people have reported it anecdotally. Um, lots of permafrost melting going on in certain northern Alaskan communities, which causes all sorts of issues, including the fact that that can cause roads to crack and things like that, as well as um, exacerbating problems with river and sea erosion. There's you know, erosion is a natural process, but it can be greatly accelerated by human factors. And that can then lead to, as we see in Alaska, uh, a number of villages needing to be relocated as a result of this. All right, well, with that kind of intro or segue into climate change, let's talk a little bit about the concept of vulnerability. So vulnerability often gets used in talking about climate change, and it's an important concept. Um, means exactly what you would think it means. How vulnerable are you to climate change? How much will you be impacted by climate change? Um, typically, when we're talking about impacts and vulnerability in this context, we mean negative impacts or um, stressful impacts. That is not to dismiss that for some areas and for some populations there might be positive impacts of climate change. Uh, we could certainly think through some of those. However, what we're focusing on today specifically is sort of vulnerability as a concept that gets passed around a lot when we talk about climate change. Now, one of the thing there's a few different case studies that we read this week or that some of you read because we did, had some, you know, pick one of three kind of readings this week. And I want to talk about these different case studies and some lessons they can teach us about vulnerability. First one was the reading, that, or rather the video that we watched about Tuvalu and climate change. So Tuvalu, if you're not familiar, is an island nation uh, not so far as far as geography goes, not so far off the coast of Australia and Papua New Guinea and New Zealand over here. Um, it is very, very vulnerable to climate change, and that has been the focus of quite a bit of news attention. It's sometimes referred to as, quote, the first climate refugees, with the idea being that this will not be the last group. Um, a significant proportion of the world's global population lives within 50 to 100 miles of coastal areas. Some of them live right on coastal areas, um, obvious, for obvious reasons, right? Shipping routes and different things, um, as well as fishing, have meant that large city centers have often been built on coastal areas. Uh, and those areas are particularly vulnerable to even minor increases in sea level rise, especially in cases like Tuvalu, uh, where the elevation is so low. And so Tuvalu, um, 
has had multiple issues related to climate change that they are either already seeing or projecting to see or sort of starting to see the beginnings of and it will likely get worse. Uh, so one of this is actual flooding in the sense that the t either the tide coming up more or what more so seems to be happening is that when there is storm events um, they're coming up further and eroding more of the soil and then like eating away at fields and things like that where people are trying to grow their crops and it's not a large land mass to begin with and so if you're losing more of your land to coastal erosion as a result of climate change that's a significant impact so there's that there's seawater level rise in general right uh, on the edges of the island um, that's sort of the way we presented this you know Tuvalu and island nation that in such amount of decades could literally be submerged in water, right, is the prediction that's being made. In the more immediate short term, as in things we're already seeing too, another impact to note is saltwater intrusion. Um, so Tuvalu, like I said, felt relatively small landmass, um, relatively few freshwater sources as a result, need to make sure those are kept clean and healthy. Um, with rising sea levels, what you're getting is salt water coming up higher and then be sitting on top of the soil and then working its way down into the water table, thereby polluting groundwater sources and other freshwater sources. Um, that's problematic, as one can probably see pretty quickly, right? Making water less drinkable, either meaning you have to invest in very costly water purification infrastructure or import your water more, neither of which is great, especially for a small country that's not, um, you know, the largest economy on the earth by any stretch. And this picture on the right, by the way, is Simon Cove. This video was sort of semi-viral, or actually, there was another better image um, from the other angle, but he gave a video, he's Tuvalu's foreign minister, and he gave a video address uh, during the Glasgow uh, Climate Summit last year, um, in which he stood um, knee-deep in ocean water in his suit uh, to make a point as he was pointing out about the profound impacts of climate change on Tuvalu, as well as the big steps that Tuvalu is trying to take, as you heard about in that video, to try to help their people um, adapt well to climate change, but also try to mitigate their own impacts on climate change, right? Sustainable energy initiatives, things like this. So Tuvalu has taken this on in a very serious way. The government of Tuvalu certainly has, and a lot of outside groups have really recognized this as a case, sort of a... Um, the bleeding edge, so to speak, of climate change impacts with sort of people already being displaced uh, potentially by climate change and people um, migrating, therefore, to places such as Australia. So an increased rate of two balloons migrating to Australia. So a nation that may possibly lose its land um, as a result of climate change. It's an incredibly sobering story. So part of what makes Tuvalu vulnerable then is clearly just pure realities of the physical location being at sea level. Other things that make Tuvalu vulnerable are more cultural realities, um, such as reliance on small-scale farming, right? Um, so it's a mix of physical and cultural factors. On that note, um, another kind of case study in the fact that vulnerability is partly physical but also very much cultural is the readings you did on Inuit people, generally speaking, in relation to climate change. So Inuit's kind of a big overarching term, and you may wonder why we were doing readings both from Nunavut and Alaska. Um, and the, the logic there is that you have several culturally and linguistically related groups spread across the Arctic um, in Greenland, Kalalasut speaking people in Canada, Inuktitut speaking people um, in Alaska, Nupiak speaking people, all of whom sort of fall under this broad umbrella of Inuit groups, Inuit speaking groups. Again, culturally, linguistically closely related, but covering a very, very wide territory and obviously with cultural and language differences between these. <coughs> now, um, Different people did different readings, but what you probably noticed as a common theme in all three, or in whichever one you did, is that there was a lot of vulnerability to climate change. Um, for example, in the video that you watched, people talking about it making it uh, more difficult to hunt, for example, or causing the seasons to occur in a way that's not normally how it occurs. Um, in your in the um, knowledge that's being lost reading, they talked about, among other things, um, the ways in which people's long-held ecological knowledge, so um, knowledge that's been passed down over generations about the flow of the seasons, about the flow of sort of snow pre precipitation and different things, things that are keyed into when you go hunting and when you do different activities, 
suddenly that ecological knowledge is less useful as the climactic changes as the climate changes and the environment acts in ways that really don't match what your ancestors were experiencing a hundred years ago and so that's another kind of impact um, part and you know the reading from Nunavut highlighted all sorts of different impacts including again infrastructure impacts when permafrost melts can affect buildings as the foundation erodes out or rather the soil under the foundation and then parts of the building actually um, experience damage, cracking as a result, as roads um, erode away and in very rural areas where that might be, you know, one of your only roads to get anywhere. These are big impacts and as should be pretty obvious, um, perhaps the these are not just a result of physical location, right? So there's a physical narrative there about sort of where it warms the most rapidly in the world, but also there's cultural factors at play here vulnerability occurs in a socio-cultural and political economic context. Uh, the fact that in some communities people are still, if not entirely reliant on hunting, is at least still doing a lot of hunting as part of their subsistence makes them potentially a lot more vulnerable to if certain prey species are no longer available. Um, or, as one of the readings I think brought out, if ice fishing and as well as ice seal hunting um, become a lot less feasible because the ice is thinner and therefore you're worried about stepping on it and going through. Uh, you know, if you if hunting starts to be that dangerous, people are just going to stop ice hunting at some point potentially. And so there's cultural factors as far as vulnerability. That's not even getting into sort of more spiritual and cultural factors about what the land means to people and what it feels like when you see it changing rapidly. There's also political slash economic factors. For example, if you're um, some of our Inupiaq communities, there's exceptions to this, but a lot of our Inupiaq communities in the far north of Alaska are very rural, are very isolated. And so again, if a road starts to have the permafrost erode out and starts to be damaged to the road, um, that's a big concern if that's the community's only road or one of their only roads, um, especially one of their only roads maybe to get to somewhere with a grocery store or something like that, right? That's a huge impact. Um, and it's one which, at the risk of sounding pessimistic here, um, you sometimes wonder in any state, in any country, um, rural areas sometimes don't get as much funding as urban areas. That's not always the case, but sometimes is. And so you worry, are these roads going to be replaced? Or if they are replaced, at what cost, right? That's a significant cost to the state or to the village or to whoever is footing the bill on that. And so again, um, vulnerability is a result of multiple factors, physical location, but also cultural factors, but also political and economic factors. Um, I should say, and I think the Nunavut reading brought this out, this again is not to say that all impacts of climate change must be negative. I think, again, I think it was the Nunavut reading that talked about um, at least a few elders saying like, oh, this means certain kinds of whales will come further up the coast and therefore we're going to start having different kinds of prey species available. Um, that may not have been in this reading, but I've heard that in other contexts. Um, and so, yeah, one could bring up as well impacts like that. And in that case, from the perspective of a subsistence hunter, potentially a positive impact. Um, so that's worth mentioning as well. Although most of the impacts that came out in these readings were what we would regard as negative impacts, right? Things where people are going to have to spend additional money, not be able to hunt in the ways they're used to, things of this nature. Uh, but potentially some positive impacts as well. Um, I think they talked about in the Nunavut reading increased tourism potential as well with warmer temperatures, obviously. Um, so we talked a minute ago about erosion um, and how climate change can exacerbate that by doing higher sea levels that come up higher and start eroding out the banks as well as larger storm events. These are This is from an EPA document um, and this shows 12 different Alaska native villages, um, all of them or most of them pretty remote, which are in situations either on the coast or on a river. Um, where they are, the location is getting eroded out by the water and where people will probably have to relocate. 
as a result. Uh, there's already been, I forget which one, but one of these has already been relocated, um, and others it's very much sort of something that will most likely have to happen at some point in coming decades. And again, it's not to say erosion never happens. Obviously, erosion is a natural way in which the world works, but much like a lot of other things, such as species extinction or such as um, warming temperatures in general, it's something that's been accelerated and accelerated at a rate in which it's causing really noticeable impacts for communities, in this case, erosion impacts, um, which is a huge cost, obviously, either for the community or for um, perhaps a regional corporation that's helping pay for it in the case of some Alaska native villages or perhaps the state. It's a large economic impact upon Alaskans and most likely on rural Alaska native Alaskans. So that's worth remembering. Um, this is from that same EPA document and it's a home literally going over the edge because of eroded out um, banks. So, Inuit climate change, um, a little bit more on that. This is a quote from Akaluk Linj. I apologize, I do not speak Inupiaq. Um, they say the Inuit are experiencing firsthand the adverse effects of climate change. We are on the front line of globalization. It's not just a theory to us in the Arctic, it's a stark and dangerous reality. This isn't to suggest that all Inupiaq people feel the same about climate change or have the same opinions about it, but it is to suggest that definitely some Inupiaq and Inuit leaders have expressed concern along some of these lines that we've talked about. We could talk also for an example of sort of different ideas of vulnerability. We could talk also about um, the reading that some of you did from myself. Uh, forgive me if that seemed a little narcissistic to have you uh, to put my own reading as one of the options. Um, it's called Victims of Adaptation, Climate Change, Sacred Mountains, and Perverse Resilience. So I talk, um, I'm drawing on a concept called Perverse Re Resilience from a study by Phelan et al., where they basically talk about the fact that sometimes something makes one group or industry or country more resilient in the face of climate change, right, more able to adapt, while simultaneously harming others. So they specifically talk about ways in which um, greenhouse gas industries have been, or I should say, sorry, um, fossil fuel industries have been able to sort of insulate themselves from some of the impacts of this, of climate change. Um, although degree, what degree is pretty debatable. I kind of use that concept and then talk about perverse adaptation instead. Just talk about the fact that, you know, one person might adapt, quote unquote, to climate change in a certain way. That might be how they present it. But that adaptation itself might have additional environmental impacts that then harm other people and therefore make their vulnerability to climate change in a sense worse in sort of this indirect way. Um, so I use the case study of the Sacred Mountain in Arizona that I studied and the way in which um, people that run the ski resort as well as some people outside of the ski resort, either journalists or government officials, have presented it as a way of adapting to drought conditions uh, and in recent years have even started talking about it as sort of an adaptation to climate change um, as a way of sort of explaining how the ski resort was struggling um, during drought conditions in Arizona. So the adaptation then, quote unquote, is artificial snowmaking using reclaimed wastewater, so piping up some water up to the, the ski slopes and then shooting it out over the um, landscape at a frozen temperature and allowing for there to be more snow cover so the ski resort can be open longer. It certainly allows the ski resort to adapt to climate change conditions and or drought conditions by staying open longer, but there's a huge, again, cultural context of vulnerability. Once again, vulnerability is partly a cultural factor and a political factor here, right? Um, a for-profit business is made more adaptable, but who is impacted by that? What are the after effects? Well, one of the after effects is, of course, is that it uses some of the water supply, the reclaimed water supply, but water supply nonetheless of the local city, Flagstaff. At the same time, Flagstaff benefits economically by selling the water, but others would point out that they sell it at a very low rate compared to what they perhaps could. It's a somewhat complex economic argument. Um, and so, you can go back and forth with that, but one would argue that potentially this is an impact for sure for Flagstaff water users, perhaps especially in the future as reclaimed water comes to be something that's more widely used. Already it's used for things like irrigating lawn in that city, um, irrigating golf courses. The other 
even larger impact perhaps though is impact on Navajo, Hopi, and other indigenous people who use this land for religious ceremonies and regard it as sacred. And so snowmaking is seen by many of these groups as profoundly desecrating, um, as something that interferes with ceremonies by making the land disturbed, something that makes the land feel and be less sacred as something which may drive away holy beings, either directly or indirectly. And so in that regard, there are huge vulnerabilities that are not just as simple as a rising temperature to climate change, but instead as complex as a politically powerful entity, right, to, uh, using water resources to adapt, and then in the process harming the spiritual practices of another community. That whole situation, that whole vulnerability can't be understood from a simplistic sort of where are people located and what, how's the temperature rising, but instead you have to understand the local political factors um, and sort of the winners or at least the less losers and then um, the victims of climate change in these contexts. So important stuff, I think. Um, finally, well, this is probably a good place to pause. I'll do that.